Hello, it's uh, Scott Manley here, and yeah, I am on holiday still with my parents, so uh, I found this book in the house that we're staying in. We're basically renting a house in Sea Ranch, and the owners of these houses like to populate the, them with a bunch of books so that people are, are kept busy, I guess, and, and a lot of them seem to be old and used, and this one caught my eye because it's a, an astronomical book from uh, 1940, and it's kind of cool to look at these old things and see you know, what has changed in a popular perception. So, um, what have we got in here that's worth looking at? I actually, I've obviously marked a few pages. Look, we have uh, some his stuff about the history of astronomy with Galileo demonstrating his telescope. We have a, a nice picture of uh, Saturn using the most up-to-date technology available in that era. And uh, actually, let's. there's a lot of pictures of telescopes which, you know, were huge in their day and they're talking about the new somewhere in the book where they talk about the new massive um, 200 inch mirror which is going to be coming online soon or maybe it's 200 uh, millimeter 2000 millimeters I don't know but it's big um, but yeah so at this point you know they figured out the basics of quantum mechanics and stuff and they come up with the big well big bang theory and whatever but it was still um, somewhat controversial I imagine they know about relativity and there's a nice quote here from saying that the diameter of space according to Edwin Hubble is 168 trillion light years and yes um, <laughs> that is significantly off from the current estimates of the universe what else they have a nice little section where they they talk about s the temperatures of stars now of course it's an American book and uh, they are all in Fahrenheit which uh, makes it very hard for me to actually make any sense of them at all. Uh, I can just about understand Fahrenheit for weather, but um, I'm much more used to dealing with Kelvin for everything else. But yeah, oh yeah, so uh, they had actually imaged the... By this point, they had actually imaged the companion to Sirius, and they speak about how it is very small, and they declare... Finally, it was seen by means of an endless experiment and observation that a cubic inch of the matter comprising the companion star to Sirius weighs a ton. It was classified as a white dwarf. There we go. So skipping forward, we go into uh, the solar system here. They talk about uh, this telescope for looking at the, the Mount Wilson Observatory for looking at the surface of the sun. Now, uh, this is pre-World War II, so nobody had ever heard of the hydrogen bomb, never mind, or the atom bomb, never mind the hydrogen bomb. So explaining hydrogen fusion uh, to a completely unknowing audience clearly is quite a complicated affair, but they actually talk about, has been demonstrated that the helium atom does not weigh precisely four times as much as a hydrogen atom, although made up of four electrons and four protons. Four protons? What's made of four protons? Sorry. Um, <laughs> it is not made up of four protons. Uh, I wonder if that's deliberate. If that, that's that's an interesting concept. I hadn't thought. Maybe they thought that um, those protons are in fact neutrons or something. I don't know. But anyway, they talked about how the Einstein's formula, they calculate the, the energy released, and they mentioned that uh, a teaspoon of water, the hydrogen contained in it, would be sufficient to push a ship across the ocean. So yeah, we skip a little further forward and we actually get to uh, Mercury, a year in 88 days. Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. At, because of all the planets, uh, it orbits around the sun in 88 days. It receives a great intensity of the radiation. But they make the assumption that Earth, or sorry, that Mercury rotates at the same speed as its orbit. Something which we know to be completely bogus. In fact, uh, Mercury rotates with a period of something like it, of one and a half times its orbit. Which means that it takes two complete rotations around the Sun before it completes uh, one rotation relative to the Sun. And uh, this caused some problem when a mariner went to visit the planet Mercury. It basically visited the planet Mercury twice and took photos of it. And just because it did it between uh, two orbits apart, it showed the same side. And so a lot of books during the 19th or 20th century, they would publish these photos next to each other and say, 
hey, Mercury doesn't rotate. My own, my science teachers in school told me this myth, and it was well known by the time I was a kid that Mercury did in fact rotate. But I even see this in the Kerbal Space Program forums, that people still believe that Mercury is tidally locked to the Sun when it is not the case. But yeah, they talk about how, you know, on one side there would be lakes of molten lead, and on the other it would be so cold it would be brittle and shatter like glass. Now, Venus, of course, was still locked under clouds, and they talk about how the the atmosphere of Venus indicated a temperature about 10 degrees of, below Fahrenheit on the dark side, with a temperature on the bright side only a few degrees warmer. The temperature can be compared with that of our own stratosphere. Carrying the comparison through, one would be led to believe that the surface of the planet is much warmer than that of the Earth, and any form of life which might possibly exist there would be probably be ponderous and sluggish, somewhat comparable to the great prehistoric dinosaurs of our own planet. These creatures would probably be unaware of the existence of the sun and other bodies exterior to the own sphere because of the visual impenetrability of the atmosphere. So, you know, they, they talk about this. Uh, they also are un, they're not aware of whether Venus rotates. Um, in fact, it does rotate just very, very slowly, so slowly that, in fact, it appears to rotate backwards. Mars, well, by this point, they have realized that the word canali have uh, been mistranslated. Yeah, in 1877, he discovered what we called the canali. The word was mistakenly translated as canals. Um, these network of fine lines are, you know, are difficult to distinguish, and there's controversy as to whether they actually exist. If they really do exist, they show considerable evidence of being artificially constructed. And those who to support the theory or existence of intelligent life on the planet hold this fact as evidence, etc., etc. Now, there is actually um, there's occasional pleasance of floating crowds. I'm trying to... Well, they talk about the moons of Mars. There's somewhere else where they talk about these possibly being... Ha! The observation of these phenomena has led to the belief that the melting of the polar caps supplies moisture from which some form of vegetarian vegetation derive nourishment. So they're still talking in terms of life on Mars. They also go on and they talk about the moon. And what's interesting here is this map of the moon where they say each peak is higher than the highest mountains on Earth. Which, uh, as I understand it, is completely bogus. The mountains on the moon are smaller, in fact, than the Earth. Uh, was there a lost continent? Yes, in a book on astronomy, they go on and they discuss about whether there was a lost continent in the Atlantic. Interesting, plea World War II. They have this description of depth finding using sound, which of course went on to be to become sonar. It was very important during the submarine battles during World War II. Uh, there is no discussion of continental drift because continental drift was considered crazy man talk until uh, well, until towards the end of the 20th, 20th century. Uh, oh yeah, the lithosphere. Now they do talk a lot about the age of the Earth. And this little article here specifically says that they estimate that according to the data on radioactive elements, the Earth must be not less than 2 billion years old. So uh, this book has an estimate of the age of the Earth, which is at least half of what the actual age is. Skipping forward, you can see uh, the geology. They, still, they, they, they had this notion of different layering in the planetary interior, but you see here that the crust is actually way thicker than we now know it to be. The crust uh, is about as thickness of the a piece of paper on this scale. Um, they talk about the outer shell being about 750 miles thick, containing primarily rocks of various types, whatever. And let's see. Oh, yes, we have this wonderful picture of the planet Jupiter, again using the best technology available at the time. Um, new ideas of time is where they specifically try to explain the notion of uh, relativity and the the Earth and the comet's tail. I'm trying to find. I clearly haven't bookmarked this. This was when they were trying to figure out what eclipses they could use to measure the 
the displacement of the pla of the stars near the sun during a solar eclipse, so they could determine whether relativity was correct. And where is is there is a whole discussion on stellar aberration? Aha, solar eclipse, wonderful. They talk about simultaneously and. Minkowski world and all this. So they actually go pretty deeply into relativity, but it seems kind of tacked on at the end. Here's a one, two, and three dimensions without a, and then saying, hey, four dimensions is just one more step. So yeah, I don't know. There's, I probably if I went into this book, I would find uh, some crazy stuff. Anyway, I'm Scott Manley, and I hear my kids shouting, so I am gonna send this off to 